praise the name of Jesus. I greet you all in Jesus' name. My name is Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Marita. I love Jesus. I'm born again, and I'm so privileged and honored today to come and share the Word of God with you through to my new television. So welcome in Jesus' name. I trust you've been well. You've been blessed by the messages that have been shared by our bishop and the various uh, speakers that have stood before you. And I know that you are growing in faith. Your life is changing. And God is working in you, with you, and for you. So welcome again in Jesus' name. And I will pray for you, our viewer. And we know that God hears and answers prayer. So welcome. Uh, I want to uh, share with you that Jesus can mend broken and shattered dreams. Jesus can mend broken dreams. He can mend shattered dreams. And my scripture of reference comes from the book of Ruth. <laughs> We have heard about Ruth, we have heard about Naum, and that is where I'm basing this word of today from, because it's a story of what it used to be, my former life. This is how I was, and in between, something happened. And now I am this way. And so it's also about the power of the testimony. Amen. So welcome in Jesus' name. And it's about the difference that Jesus can make in one's life if you allow him to. Jesus can make a difference in your life if you allow him to. Today, your dreams may have been shattered. Your dreams may have been broken today. But you know something? If you allow Jesus to work, he can revive those dreams and he can make them real. The Bible says in the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, Then Elimelech, Naum's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Ophir, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Marlon and Kilion also died. So the women survived her two sons and her husband. They came from their previous place. Their previous life was a life of fullness, complete family. But see here what happens. Nam's husband dies. Her two sons die. And the two sons had gotten themselves wives in Moab. They die and they leave their wives. So here we have three women who had husbands, who had high hopes, who had aspirations who had dreams through their husbands, but now their husbands are no more. So the book of Ruth is a story of two widows and a farmer in a remote village. And this book of Ruth was written at the same time as the book of Judges. They lived during the Judges, and it is a wonderful contrast to the previous book of Judges, while the context of the two books is identical, Ruth is set in the days when the Judges ruled, 
uh, according to Ruth 1.1, the content of the two books is very different. God makes the difference. While Judges recounts a list of evil and upheaval because everyone did as they saw fit. Judges 21.25 The book of Ruth is a wonderful story of loyalty, faithfulness, and kindness. All the more impressive for taking place in this period of strife. Furthermore, while Judges looks at the big picture of the nation of Israel during this period, the book of Ruth is focused on a specific family. So this is a reminder to us that the God of the universe and of history is also the God of all the little details in your life or in my life, in the individual life. As much as God is concerned about the whole nation, he goes in between and cares about the individual, cares about you as the individual, cares about me as the individual. We see it here in the book of Ruth. He's not just almighty and powerful, but God is also our Father who is intimately concerned with us with you as an individual, with I as an individual. He says, when you were yet in your mother's womb, he knew you. We were all not in our mother's wombs at the same time. Each of us was in our mother's womb at our own specific time. And God says, when you were in that womb, I knew you. So God cares about you as an individual. He cares about me as, my, as an individual. When I was being formed in my mother's womb, he was there. When you are being formed in your mother's womb, he was there. God cares about you. He says that he knows your name. He knows the number of hair in your head. The number that falls down, he knows the number of your bones and he knows every step that you take. He knows every word in your mouth even before you utter it, even before you speak it, he knows. So our God is an all-knowing God. You need to come to that position for knowledge is power. I know that God knows about you. He knows your beginning. He knows you're going out and you're coming in. He knows you're down sitting and you're rising up. He knows every step that you take. God is all-knowing. And he loves us. For he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given us unto us, that we should be called the sons of God. God does not want us to live a life of uh, feeling uh, neglected, rejected. He comes in and steps in as a father. And he says, you are not fatherless. I am a father to you. You are my son. Behold what manner of love the father has given to us. That we should be called the sons of God. And so today, for you that has received Jesus in your life, know that you are a son of God. You are not fatherless. John 1.12 says, to them that believed God, in Jesus, God gave them power to become the children of God. And so today we are children of God. We are not fatherless. We, don't, we are not 
uh, walking aimlessly like we don't have a shepherd. We have a shepherd. We have a father who cares for us as his children. Today he calls us his children. He calls us his son. He cares about you. He cares about your dreams. He cares about your aspirations. He cares about what you're going through right now. I know there are those that are hurting because of what you have gone through. But you know something? You have a father. And in the father's house, there is a high priest. And the name of this high priest is called Jesus. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, our high priest, is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus is our elder brother, and he is in the Father's house. Hallelujah. But if you have not received Jesus, you still can have an opportunity to come under the cover of God and have God as your Father who art in heaven. You can become a son of God by believing in Jesus. Hallelujah. Today, you can experience that love. You can come on board under the shadow of the Almighty, under the cover, under his feathers. Hallelujah. To him that knows you, to him that knows the plan that he has for you. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for good and not for evil. To give you a hope and a future. Hallelujah. So refocus. Refocus and look up. Refocus and look to God. Refocus and look to your father. The all-knowing father. Hallelujah. He knows everything. And so your life and all the details matter to God. Your life counts. He knows the number of hair on your head. He knows every step that you take. He knows the number of your bones. He knows the number of your days. He knows your name. He knows the plans that he has for you. He knows your down sitting and your rising up. He knows every word in your mouth, even before you speak it. Hallelujah. He knew you when you were yet in your mother's womb. He knows the way that you take. He knows your thoughts. He knows, he knows. He knows everything. Trust him with your life. Make an about turn. Come to him that knows everything about you. Come to him that knows the plan for your life. Inquire of him. He knew about David in the wilderness when he was taking care of his father's flock, a shepherd boy. God knew the plans that he had for David. And eventually he brought David to the perfect place. God can do it again. He's no respecter of persons. He knows. It's good for you to have that knowledge that God of heaven knows. Your creator knows. He knows everything about you. You may have been disappointed. But you know something? Refocus. Look up to your father who art in heaven. He knows and he says you are more precious than many sparrows. And so the book of Ruth reminds us of God's care. It reminds us of God's provision and faithfulness in the little pieces of our life. We see that Naomi's life was going well. She had a great husband. She had two fine sons who had two wonderful wives. Then the unthinkable happened. Her husband died. A little time later, both her sons died. 
Naum and her daughter-in-law find themselves in the midst of shattered dreams. This isn't how life was supposed to be. Maybe that's what you're saying. You have come to that place and you're saying this is not how life was supposed to be. Because you have suffered loss. You have gone through pain. Things have changed drastically from good to worse. What you expected is not what you have today. It happened to now. It happened to her, to the, her two daughter-in-laws. But you know something? God was in their midst. They allowed God to be a partner in their lives. Maybe this is where you feel you are today. A place of despair. A place of hopelessness. A place of disappointments. A place of failure. A place of fear of tomorrow. A place of rejection. Broken relationships. Forsaken. A place of retardation, stagnation, confusion, loss. And you're saying, I'm in the wrong place. You've been robbed of precious relationships, things, aspirations, ideas. It is see, some robbery has taken place. You feel I've been robbed. You feel empty, void, nothing. You feel useless, total loss and lost. You don't know what to do. It's like you are on a downward spiral trend. But this is what Joel tells us in Joel 1, 3, 4. Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children about their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, you're saying the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Maybe that's where you are. Loss after loss after loss after loss. Locust after locust after locust. Eating and eating and devouring and devouring. But I want to tell you what to do. Bring everything to the Savior's feet. Bring everything to the Savior's feet. Look at Naum's re reaction to her situation. This is what she said. She said in Ruth 1.13, For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. We see her true feelings about the situation. How could a loving father let this happen? You're asking, how could a loving father let this happen? Whatever has happened to you, I may not know. But you are seeing like the father is against you. The hand of God is against you. This was the situation with Naum. And then she said, don't call me Naum, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me now, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? We know Mara means bitter. She knew where she was. She was bitter towards the so-called God of love. How can I possibly reconcile with this? You're asking. You look to the right, you look to the left, no solution. You look back, you look forward, no solution. It is time to look up. It is time to lift your eyes and look up. David said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence my help comes from. My help comes from the Father that made the heavens and the earth. It's time to refocus. It's time to look up. Lift up your eyes to the hills. Lift up your eyes to God. Look up. That's where you will find permanent 
help. God is your helper in time of trouble. He's a very present help in time of need. And his grace is sufficient for you. Today, I'm here to implore you in the name of Jesus to look up. Look up to God. Cry out to him. Hallelujah. The Bible says, The rain falls on the rushes and the unrushes. Naomi and Ruth moved to a community where some of her relatives live. This is they moved back to Bethlehem. Ruth goes out to work in the fields to put food on the table. She just so happens to work in the field of a wealthy farmer named Boaz. When Ruth tells her this, the first day of hope penetrates her bitter heart. Even she can recognize the hand of God. You need to recognize the hand of God. Come back to the community of love. Move away from the haters. Come to the people that love you. Hallelujah. And recognize that God is a God, is still a God of love. God has brought you to this community. Hallelujah. And I'm talking to you that has come back to church, that has come back to the people that love you, that these people will come out and work with you and for you. They will pray with you. They will pray for you. They will encourage you. Hallelujah. So you don't have to be out there lonely like you don't have people. You have people. The people of God. Come back and experience the love of God. Know that it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. You belong to God. So don't act like you are in charge of your life. Give God space in your life. Let him be God and do what he only can do. He can do much more than you think or ask. Amen. And the story of Ruth continues. We are seeing how God is now restoring. How God is now mending the shattered dream, the broken dream. We see her telling the relative whom she worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he, of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. God has not forsaken his kindness to you. Now I'm here testifies in Ruth 2 that God has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. He is still God. His kindness and his mercies endure forever. The mercies of the Lord are new every morning. So God has not forsaken you. You may be in a place of doubt where you're doubting. Is God really for me? Is God with me? You are not alone. We see Gideon doubted. Thomas too doubted. Sarah and Abraham also laughed at God's promise, but they didn't remain there. They moved away from their position of doubt. And that's what you need to do. Move from your position of doubt and come to the place of faith. Come to the place of believing God, that God can accomplish every purpose that concerns you. He is the one that has the plan for your life. So come out of the place of doubt. Come out of that place of fear. Come out of that place of sorrow. Come to the place of faith. Come to the place of belief. And believe God. For he that believes, the Bible says that all things are possible to them that believe. And nothing is impossible with God. So move away from the place of doubt. Gideon had to move from the place of doubt. 
Thomas too had to move from the place of doubt. You need to move from the place of doubt where you are doubting whether God is for you or not. I'm here to encourage you and to say God is for you and God is no respecter of persons. He knows the plan that he has for you. He knows your name. He knows every step that you take. He knows your ways. He knows your destiny, where you ought to be. Come back to the place of faith. Come back to the place of belief. Believe that it is well with you and that all things are working together for your good. Hallelujah. You are a child of God. You are a son of God if you have Jesus. You have a father in heaven. It's time to refocus and to look up. Hallelujah. But so we see in the end that Gideon, Thomas, Sarah, Abraham, all the doubters, Peter, they were all transformed from doubting to believing. So transform your doubting into believing. For to him that believeth, all things are possible. Hallelujah. All things are possible. Believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. So I'm here to encourage you. We have read in Joel how the different worms have eaten and eaten and eaten until you're saying, I have nothing left. God can restore. For God is a restorer. The Bible says that Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. He restored blind eyes. He restored the lame limbs, the lost lives. He brought the dead back to life. He has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will restore. Just know where to go for your deliverance and restoration. Know where to take your broken dreams. Take them to Jesus. Bring your broken dreams to Jesus. He is the restorer. He will breathe the breath of life upon you. And you will be alive again. Hallelujah. Bring your broken dreams to Jesus. The Lord says that he will restore all that the canker worm had eaten. He will restore what the palm worm has eaten. And so it does not matter which worm has invaded your life and has been eating you up to destroy you. I want to say they will not succeed. Though their mission is to abort what God has for you, I'm here to encourage you that God is going to abolish their mission. Hallelujah. So commit your dreams to God. Commit your ways to God. Commit your desires to God. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall grant you the desires of your heart. God is able to restore to you the ears that the locust hath eaten, the ears that the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm have eaten. He says in Joel 2, 21, 30, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then. Ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain 
and the latter rain in the first month, double for your trouble. That is what God is saying. You have suffered loss. God is saying, I'm bringing the latter rain. I'm bringing the former rain, both of them together, double for your trouble. That is what you ought to look forward to. Double for your trouble. Hallelujah. Look forward to double for your trouble. He says, I will bring the former rain and the latter rain. Not very far. Sooner than you think. Sooner than you expect. God is going to do it. You need to take get, get hold of God's word. Now it is time to take hold of the word of God and move with it. Forget about the words of men. Forget about the words of, of, of if I may say, the politicians. Forget about those words. Take hold of the word of God. Say, God, you're giving me the former rain and the latter rain. You're giving me double for my trouble. Hallelujah. You are restoring to me what the kanka worm has eaten, the pama worm has eaten, whatever the worms have eaten, Lord, you are restoring. It is time for restoration. I shall laugh again. I shall rejoice again. Hallelujah. Oh, I shall be up and about again. You are restoring back to me what I have lost. Double for my trouble. It is time to take hold of the word of God and begin to say it. Believe it and speak it. Be full of the word for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Fill your word with the promise of God. Take these verses of Joel. And say, I'm going to be glad, for I am a child of Zion. I will rejoice in the Lord my God, for he has given me the former rain faithfully, faithfully, without delay, without reducing the measure, the former rain faithfully. God says he's restoring you to your former, hallelujah, the former rain which means you are going to recover all just like David recovered all. Oh, thank you, Lord. The former rain, which means you had it. It was there. And God is saying, I'm bringing the former rain. I will be glad. I will rejoice in the Lord my God, for he has given me the former rain faithfully. Faithfully, the former rain. What is it that you formerly had? And now it is, appears like it is lost. It is no longer in your hands. Is it a business? Is it for money? Is it relationships? The former. God is saying, I am restoring. We see David had things before the city of Ziglag was burnt down. He had a family. He had wives. He had children. But the enemy came and took them captive. And David went to the Lord and said and asked the Lord, am I going to get the former things that I had before this city was burnt down? And God told him, yes, you will get the former. Pursue and you will get the former. And that is what God is telling us. That is, we are getting the former, the former joy, the former position. Hallelujah. God is bringing a revival back to us. I know you may, have, you may be going through a lot of pain currently because of what is happening around. And you see no reason of continuing to believe God. And you're asking, does God exist? Is his love still there? The love that I used to experience before, I want to say that that love is still there. That power is still there. The word of God is still there. The former God is saying the former faithfully. And it will cause the rain to come down for you. Hallelujah. The former rain and the latter rain. The former and the latter. God is saying there is going to be an increase. Hallelujah. I'm not just bringing the former, but I'm also bringing a latter rain, a rain that you have never experienced before. New things. Hallelujah. But only if you will arise from where you are today and come back to the position of faith. Come back to the position of believing. God is able to restore. 
And it says, The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the ears that the swarming locusts has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. Hallelujah. God is saying, I will restore to you the ears. God is a restorer. Come back to your position of faith. He is a father. He can mend your broken dreams. He can mend your shattered dreams. Come back to God. He's saying, I will restore. He takes that role and that responsibility and declares, I will restore. Come back to God and remind him, God, you have said you will restore. Take God by his word. He is a restorer. Tell him, Lord, restore. Restore the wasted ears. Restore, Lord. Oh, restore the ears that the swarming locust has eaten. Name what has eaten your ears. Name it before the Lord. Tell the Lord, restore. You have promised to restore. You have said, I am a restorer, and I am restoring. Lord, I believe you. Restore, Lord. Restore, Lord. Restore. And verse 26 says, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord, your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. He restored Ruth. He restored now. When you read the book of Ruth, you will see the, a God who is a restorer. He restored double for their troubles. Hallelujah. God is a restorer because they chose to go back to their place of worship to a place of praise. They move from bitterness to praise, to thanksgiving, to glorifying God. They came back to the position where they would experience the love of the Father in heaven, God of heaven. Come back to the Father. Come back to the, that place of faith. God is a restorer and is committing himself to do great things for you. He says, he will, in verse 20, 26, he says, you will eat plenty and be satisfied. There shall be plenty within your borders. Now we are talking up to you as an individual. Hallelujah. God restores the individual because before he restores the nation. When the individual is restored, then the nation shall be restored. I know many are hurting and they're wondering where is this God? God is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Come back to the position of faith. God wants to restore your wasted years. God wants you to eat in plenty and to be satisfied so that you may praise the name of the Lord your God. For he will deal wondrously with you. And he says, and my people shall never be put to shame. You are a people of God. I am a people of God. Nothing has changed my position. Hallelujah. Nothing should change your position. Whether you lose or you gain, you win, you don't, your position still remains. You are a people of God. And the Bible says you will never be put to shame. So don't allow the enemy to weigh you down. No, rise up. Rise up and take hold of the promises of God. And claim your position. In God's kingdom, you are a people of God and he says you shall not be put to shame. So shame is not your portion. Declare that shame is not my portion. I shall not be put to shame in spite of what is going on, in spite of what has happened. I will not be put to shame. It does not happen to put me to shame. No, shame is not my portion. I shall not be put to shame. Hallelujah. 
you need to confess the word of God. You need to know what God is saying. And God is saying, you, my child, you will not be put to shame. Everything works out together for good. I am at work, and he says in verse 27, then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and now it's not just Israel. Say, Lord, you are in my midst. You are in the midst of my situation. You are in the midst of my business. You are in the midst of my life. You are in the midst of my family. You are in the midst of my nation. You are in the midst of everything that concerns me, Lord, you are in my midst. The Lord God, you are in my midst. And you are Lord our God, and there is no other. You are Lord our God, and there is no other. My people, again, he repeats, shall never be put to shame. We shall never be put to shame. And that's why we are walking with our heads high and our shoulders high. Because God has said we shall never be put to shame. That's a promise you need to claim. Tell God no shame, no shame, no shame. No shame, Lord, confound them that wish me evil. Embarrass them instead. Let there be shame to them and not to me. For you have told me that there shall be no shame. I shall never be put to shame. And it says afterward. Afterward, this is what God is saying. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. After he has done all this, he has dealt with the worms. He has furnished a table for you to feast in the presence of your enemies. He has dealt wondrously with you. He has restored the wasted ears. Hallelujah. He has covered you from shame and protected you from shame. He is your shield. He says he will pour his spirit upon all flesh. You, I, our flesh. God is saying I'm pouring out my spirit upon you. And so we are not empty debbers. God is pouring his spirit upon us. Now that is what is happening in the spiritual world. God is pouring. God is pouring his spirit upon all flesh, upon his children. And he says, your sons and your daughters shall pros prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Hallelujah. So the dreams are not dying. We are continuing to have dreamers in our midst. The old men shall continue to dream dreams. God, that is what God is saying. He is a restorer. He is able to mend and to bring to life the dreams. He says the old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Hallelujah. Give a shout to the Lord. It is happening. The dreams are not going to die and they will not die. Your dream will not die. My dream will not die. God is saying he will pour his spirit upon our flesh and the old men shall dream dreams. Our sons and our daughters shall prophesy. And you know what prophecy is? It's calling those things that are not as though they are. Hallelujah. Declaring the works of the Lord in our generation. Praise the name of Jesus. And that is what we are saying about our sons and our daughters. They shall prophesy. They are not going to talk about the enemy. They are not going to talk about destruction. They are going to prophesy good things. Something good is going to happen to me. Hallelujah. I shall be great in the land. I shall possess the gates of the enemy. The promises of the Lord shall come upon me and they shall overtake me. The Lord goes before me. The Lord opens the doors for me. Prophesy our sons. Prophesy our daughters. Prophesy good things. That's what the Bible says. They shall prophesy. Our sons and our daughters. And we as parents, we are standing and we are saying, our sons and our daughters shall prophesy. 
Hallelujah. The word of the Lord. They shall prophesy the promises of the Lord. And they shall say, thus says the Lord. He is a shield unto me. He is my good shepherd. He furnishes a table for me in the to feast in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I am the head and not the tail only. Hallelujah. They are prophesying and they are saying my gift shall bring me before the kings. Hallelujah. The Lord is opening a great door for me. Our sons and our daughters shall prophesy and our old men shall dream dreams. Hallelujah. So we honor our old men because they have dreams and they are dreaming dreams, not bad dreams, but good dreams. Hallelujah. Good dreams for their children, good dreams for their families. That is what God is saying. Our old men shall dream dreams. Praise the name of Jesus. And our young men shall see visions. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. And we see God saying that also on his main servants and on his maid servants, he will pour out his spirit in those days and he will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth. Hallelujah. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. As, as I said, God restored the wasted years or to Naum and Ruth. More than 10 years of waiting and hoping, but it appeared like they were going from worst to worst. But God was watching. He had a plan. God has a plan. He is scheming a generational miracle. Amen. He did it for Ruth. He did it for Naum. And Naum's generation changed. And we see Ruth becoming part of the royal family, never to be forgotten. Generational miracles are awaiting you. God has a plan which is coming for you. So put away bitterness from your heart. Ephesians 4.31 tells us, let all bitterness wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Bitterness poisons. It restricts the power of God from working in your life. It hinders the move of the Holy Spirit and the will of God from being done. Acts 8.23 says, For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Bitterness poisons. So don't allow it to poison you. Don't allow it to bind you. Bitterness defiles. It causes trouble. It stops the grace of God from being shed abroad, from being shed broadly into your heart, life. Remember, it is all by grace. We need this grace. We need the unmerited favor of God. Grace that is greater than all our sins. Put away all bitterness. Naum had to put away all bitterness and change her conversation and begin thanking God and praising God. And God restored her dream. He mended her broken dreams and her shattered dreams together with her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Hallelujah. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So let us look carefully that we don't fall short of the grace of God, his unmerited favor because of bitterness. Bitterness will cause trouble. Bitterness will defile many. Bitterness will keep grace, the grace of God, that is greater than all our sins and all our shortcomings, far from us. When Naum put away bitterness and started praising God, things changed. And the process of restoration started. And so the, there is 
that process can start today for you. There is restoration, repayment power in praise and glorifying God. Will you make an about turn today from prison to praise, from grass to grace? Make an about turn. He will restore your lost years too. He is no respecter of persons. He is the Lord God who changes not. He is a faithful and compassionate father. He will have compassion on you today. Just bring whatever it is that is shattered in your life to the Savior's feet. He can mend it. That's the right place. That's the place of miracle, the place of resurrection, inspiration, aspirations, hope. Something new will happen. A miracle is awaiting you at the Savior's feet. We know shattered dreams often lead to a world-impacting destiny. But getting there is often a process where we must work through honest feelings before we can see the God who redeems even the most devastating shattered dream. Pick up your broken pieces and bring them to the Savior's feet. Ephesians 1.22 tells us that God has put all things under the feet of Jesus and has given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So I want to declare today that all things have been put under the feet of Jesus and Jesus has been given to be head over all things to the church. Hallelujah. So don't despise the church. Jesus is the head of the church and all things have been put under him for the church. So everything has been placed under the feet of Jesus. Jesus can mend the broken and shattered dreams. Hallelujah. The singer sang and said, <clears throat> Have you failed in life's battle to accomplish your plans? Is your heart heavy laden? Do you fear the Lord's command? Do you feel that no one loves you? And there's no use to try. Just bring your cares to Jesus. Your soul he'll satisfy. Pick up the broken pieces and bring them to the Lord. Pick up the broken pieces. Trust in his holy word. He will put them back together and make your life complete. Just bring the broken pieces at the Savior's feet. Just bring the broken pieces are the Savior's feet. Amen. And so my closing verse comes from the book of Isaiah 58, 12. It says, those from among you, this is after God has restored, because he's restoring, from among us, we shall build the old west places. From among us, we shall raise up the foundations of many generations. From among us, we shall be called the repairer of the bridge, the restorer of streets to dwell in. So may God bless you, and may he restore 
your broken and shattered dreams in the name of Jesus. We love you and we wish you all the best. Continue supporting our TV station with your finances, your prayers, your goodwill messages as we continue to propagate this message of the kingdom. Be blessed and have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.